Well, did you know that the moment that you believed in Jesus, that he was raised from the dead, and you confessed him as Lord of your life, the very spirit of God was deposited within your spirit. In that moment, that heavenly deposit transformed your spirit into something brand new, no longer condemned to eternity in hell, thank God, no longer bound by sin. Your spirit was cleansed and perfected in a moment. Do you believe it? Because that is what happened. And so now within you resides the wisdom of God. Do you know that everything that you read in this wonderful, precious word of God has already been deposited in your spirit. It's already there. It already exists there. And that's the deep connection that you feel whenever you hear the word of God and it just connects. You you guys ever have those moments in church, like something is said and you're like, whoa, it's because it was already in your spirit and you just made a connection. And I love how the apostle Paul explains it in first Corinthians chapter two. He said, no one can know a person's thoughts except that person's own spirit. And no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. And we have received God's spirit, not the world's spirit. So we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. Amazing. So as I said, the spirit of God has been deposited within us. Therefore, we can know God's thoughts. We can know them. We can discover and experience all the wonderful things that God has freely given us. Let's go ahead and look at somebody next to you and say, you can know God's thoughts. Mm Mm-hmm. And all these wonderful things, what are, we, what are these wonderful things? We're talking about freedom from sin. Who's thankful for that? Isn't that wonderful? How about healing from all sickness and disease? Isn't that wonderful? How about abundant resources? Isn't that wonderful? How about rich relationships? Isn't that wonderful? God has given us all these wonderful things. That is the gospel truth. That is the good news. So why is it not a reality in some of our lives? Why? Well, I believe Hosea chapter four has the answer for us. My people are being destroyed because they don't know me. So we can know God's thoughts, but that doesn't mean that we will know God's thoughts. But wait, didn't we just read that God deposited his spirit on the inside of us? And yes, and that's true, 100%. But knowing doesn't happen in your spirit. It happens in your, in your mind, doesn't it? When we get a revelation from heaven, here's how we explain it. It's like something drops down into our spirit. Have you guys ever had, like, it just, woof, drops down. It's like it had, it had been hovering over our heads, and then we finally hear it the right way, and woof, it drops down in our spirit. And then once it drops into place, there ain't no going back, right? Ain't no going back. You carry that heavenly truth with you for the rest of your life. Nobody's going to talk you out of it. It doesn't matter what you see. I'm going to believe that. And I get why we explain it as something dropping down into our spirit, but that's not really what's going on. It's not really what's going on. As Christians, our spirits are not looking for truth. They're not looking for truth. Our spirit has been united with God's spirit. That means that every bit of truth already exists within our born again spirit. So when we have these moments of heavenly revelation, it's not that we've used our minds to enlighten our spirit. Oh no, we have not done that. Rather, our minds have finally aligned with our spirit. And that's the connection that you feel. Your mind connects with your spirit. What already existed in your spirit has now become a revelation to your mind. We can know God's thoughts. We can know God's thoughts. We simply have to align our mind with our spirit. Well, how do we do this? Easy. You hear the word of God. Man, we just keep coming back. That is like old news, isn't it? But it's good news. It's simple. Hear the word of God. Many of you will experience revelation in your mind today as you hear the word of God. How about this? All of you will experience revelation today as you hear the word of God. Your mind will finally align with your spirit, enabling you to live in God's promises. Do you want to live in God's promises? Do you want to know how to accelerate the process? Or do you want to just keep dragging it out? And you can save the promises of God for a later time. Well, there's two primary ways to accelerate the process of aligning your thoughts with what already exists in your spirit. First, every time you show up to church, expect this to happen. Expect your mind to come into alignment with the spirit of God. You just have to expect it. Show up expecting it. Well, why wouldn't you do this? Why wouldn't I do that? Well, maybe I'm talking about something that you've heard a hundred times already. So you just tune me out. Enjoy delaying the promises of God for another hundred times until you finally decide to listen. Or maybe you'd rather be critical of what I'm saying rather than leaning in for your moment of revelation. Let me help you. 
Criticism is not a spiritual gift. I don't see that one listed. God is not critical. He's not looking for a perfect performance. He's not even bothered when I don't say something quite right. You know why? Because he has a way of making up for my imperfections. It's like he's skilled at this, like he's had to do it for a little while already. And I believe he enjoys it. I can sense his smiling approval as I endeavor to do my best, and then he's just so gentle in his correction along the way. He's a good, good father. He's a wonderful father. So if you think that criticism is from God, you've been deceived by a religious spirit because once again, you've made it about the performance of man. This reminds me of a vision the Holy Spirit gave me a few months back. We were in a big performing arts center, a theater, and Jesus had just finished putting on the most amazing performance. And at the end, he motioned for me to come join him on the stage and he brought me into the middle and then he walked off and he went and he sat down with the audience. And then he joined the audience in wild applause for me. And it pleased him so much that I got the applause for his performance. I got the applause for his performance. This will never be about my performance. This will never be about your performance. Jesus has already finished the perfect performance and he attributed it to us. Isn't that amazing? It's such good news. So you don't have to be critical. That's good news too. I used to be critical and that was a miserable place to be. Now I'm not. And it's like I'm free. (laughs) So maybe this is your moment of revelation today. Just allow the love of God to cast out that fear of messing up. Because that's what it is. You have a fear of messing up. Let him cast out the fear. It's his love that casts it out. God is not afraid of you making mistakes. God is not afraid of you making, he's not afraid of me making mistakes. He knows that mistakes are part of working with mankind and that doesn't bother him. But it does bother God when you think that he requires a perfect performance. That bothers him, why? Because what you're really saying is that his son's performance was not good enough. So you have an ongoing choice to make. When those critical thoughts come up, what are you going to do with them? Reject them. Cast them out as the ungodly thoughts that they are. Or you can use them to puff yourself up, right? (laughs) I know better than Cade. I know better than so-and-so. I mean, that's what we do with these critical thoughts. Cade needs to hear what I have to say because if he knew this, then the church would grow. If he knew this, da-da-da-da-da. Those are critical thoughts, by the way, in case you were having a hard time recognizing them. And you're using those thoughts. You can either use them to puff yourself up or you can just cast them down and be free. And you might think that you're doing God a favor with all the criticism in case he needs help guiding everything, right? But he doesn't even listen to you when you point out my imperfections. Did you know that? He's not listening. Why? Because he sees me as holy and without fault in his eyes. And you can't convince him otherwise. Yeehaw! Same goes for you. He sees you as holy and without fault in his eyes. And no matter how critical someone is of you, you can't, they can't convince God to think anything else of you. Other than that, they are holy and without fault. Amen. You know, as the leader of this church, there's a lot of eyes on me. Even today, somebody pointed out, did you uh, take down your mother's curtains and turn them into a shirt? This is how guys talk to each other. I thought it was funny. Yes, actually, I did. I cut them and turned it into a shirt. I even sewed it myself. All eyes are on me, and as an apostle, which is what God has really called me to be, there's no shortage of criticism from those around me. I get to hear a lot of criticism. And you can join the critics if you would like in that ugly chorus. No, thank you. But just know, if you do, if you join the critics, you miss out on what God wants to do in your life through my life. If you're critical about anybody in this room, God wants to use all of us to work in each other's life. But the moment you're critical of them, it shuts the whole thing down. Amen. I'm helping you. I'm helping you. I'm setting you free. 
So we're talking about how to accelerate the process of aligning your thoughts with what already exists in your spirit. First, every time you show up to church, expect it to happen. Expect revelation. Expect your mind to come into alignment with the spirit of God. Wake up, go to church and say, today, my mind is coming into alignment with the spirit of God. Expect this to happen even when we're talking about something that you've heard before. And most importantly, expect it to happen despite the imperfections of the person that is standing in front of you. Amen. Amen. The second way to accelerate the process is to be disciplined in hearing the word of God every day, every day, whether you read it to yourself or watch a sermon on YouTube or just make this a part of your daily rhythm. I need to hear the word of God today. I just need to hear it. Beth and I are so hungry for the word of God that we haven't watched secular TV in over three years. And it's not because we're trying to impress God or we're trying to impress others. We simply want to hear the word of God more than we want to be entertained because we've learned the value of hearing the word of God. So every single night we're watching other ministers on YouTube. We sit and we talk about the word. We let the Bible app read to us. That works too, right? Isn't it wonderful? There are so many ways to hear the word of God. It's so easy for us in this generation. Aren't you thankful? And I, I, it's no secret that the more often you hear the word of God, the more accelerated the process is of aligning your thoughts with what already exists in your spirit. And so now, all of that, wasn't that just wonderful? That was my introduction. Preparing the ground for the word that God has for you today. And now this word is going to go into fertile ground and it's going to produce a hundredfold harvest of faith in your life. Amen. So as I release this word from God, it's going to confirm something to you today. It's going to confirm that you are dead to sickness. And as your thoughts align with your spirit, healing manifests in your body. Amen. Let's start with 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Jesus personally carried our sins in his body on the cross so that we could be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, you are healed. So Jesus didn't just forgive you of sin, although it's great that he did, he forgave us of sin, but he also made you dead to sin. He freed you from the power of sin. And so now when sin looks at you, it says, "Ugh, I'm just going to have to go find somewhere else because you just look like a dead man when sin comes around. Ugh. You are dead to sin. Sin doesn't even consider you anymore. You are not attractive to sin once you are born again. So the only reason sin remains in your life is because you entice it to return. You give it permission. You, you welcome that slimy, nasty thing into your clean house. Well, kick it out because you're dead to sin. You're dead to sin. Jesus gave you the power to live pure. And don't make this about your performance because it won't work. Just lean in to the power that Jesus already gave you to live pure. I'm here as a living testimony to tell you that it works. When you have faith in the power of Jesus Christ to help you live pure, guess what happens? You live pure. You live pure. I honestly can't remember the last time that I sinned. And I'm not puffing myself up. I'm just telling you that this works. You have faith in the power of Jesus Christ. And it sets you free. (laughs) You mean it actually works. But whenever I was trying to do it out of my own performance, trying to impress God with my ability to have good behavior, I'd fall and then I'd get up. And then I'd fall and then I'd get up. And I'd fall. Anybody ever been there? It takes faith in the power of Christ, that dunamis power. So Jesus personally carried our sins on the cross. What a thing. He personally carried our sins on the cross. So when he died, we died to sin. And when he rose from the dead, we rose with him to new life. And now, somebody say now, when? We can live for what is right. Uh, When we get to heaven, then we'll be pure. Now we can live. For what is right. What else did that verse say? Well, it said that by his wounds, you are healed. So Jesus doesn't just want you free from sin. He wants you free from sickness as well. In his eyes, they're one and the same thing. Sin, sickness, get rid of both of them. So why get freedom from sin and not sickness? Are not, all, are not both from the pit of hell? Are not both a part of the curse? Some people think that God uses sickness as a teaching tool. He allows it in your life to help develop character and and patience and even to give you compassion for the other people who are sick. Every person who teaches that should be cast out of the pulpit because it's a doctrine of demons. I don't know that there's any more anti-Christ teaching that we've ever heard in our lives other than that teaching right there. 
Because if God uses sickness, that means he is working with the devil. I mean, can you imagine this meeting between God and the devil just having a great conversation about how they're going to improve you as a person? If God uses sickness, that means Jesus was in opposition to God the whole time that he was on the earth. Do you really think that Jesus was out there just undoing God's handiwork of sickness as he went about healing all who were oppressed to the devil? Stop believing that lie. Blah. God does not use methods of destruction to teach you. God does not use methods of destruction to teach you. He instructs you with his word. His word is all you need to become who he's called you to be. But let's say you allow sickness in your life, because by the way, that's the only way it can come into your life. You have to permit it. If you allow sickness, will God find a way to use it for good? 100%. You better know it. God takes what the enemy meant for evil, and he turns it for good. But that doesn't mean that God made you sick. Don't be dumb. Think it through. <laughs> Just think it through. You allow the devil to make you sick, but God's so good and so awesome that he take that evil, he took that evil that should have never been a part of your life in the first place, and he just went ahead and he turned it around for good. Amen. There's a divine backfire for those of you who are sick. Every time we get sick, a divine backfire is coming because the devil thought he was going to take you out, but God's just going to turn it around. And as your thoughts align with, your, with the reality in your spirit that you are already healed, that healing will manifest in your body, and you're going to use that testimony, you're going to take it to others. Look what Jesus has done in my life. God is good. Amen. So let's say this together. I am dead to sin, so I can live pure. I am dead to sickness so I can live whole. Gospel truth. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. My old self has been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So let me ask you this. If Christ was in charge of your body, would it be sick? Mm. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And he loves me so much that he died for me. And through his death and resurrection, he provided four things for me and you. And it's found in Isaiah chapter 53. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. Let me put this in today's language for you. Number one, we have been completely forgiven. Number two, we have been totally released from the penalty of our sins. Number three, we have been freed from all guilt and shame and received peace in its place. And number four, we have been healed of all sickness and disease. Amen. You know, some people look at this verse and say, ah, that's not about physical healing. This is just a metaphor for spiritual healing. <clears throat> Shut up. I'm tired of hearing that. Shut up. Why is it so hard for you to believe that God, that Jesus wants to heal your physical body? Why is that so hard to believe? Did he not demonstrate it over and over and over and over? Were all those healings in the gospels metaphors too? Huh? No. Take your unbelief back to hell and leave it there and rise up in faith and receive your healing in Jesus' name. Jesus came to forgive you. Jesus came to release you of the penalty of your sin. Jesus came to break the chains of guilt and shame. Jesus came to heal your physical body. By his stripes, you were healed 2,000 years ago. It's already been done. And that's not just something that we read about. Y'all, Jesus demonstrated healing as many times as he possibly could, healing the multitudes. And then he gave us the power to do the same. Every time the sick came to Jesus, what did he do? He healed them. Every time. It didn't matter how minor or how major the sickness was. He healed them. Oh, paralyzed from birth? No big deal. Healed instantly. Stage four cancer? No big deal. Healed instantly. Demon possessed? Ah! No big deal. Healed instantly. Jesus healed every kind of sickness and every kind of disease. There's not one type of sickness that can stand against the power of Jesus Christ. There's not one. But what about the people in his own hometown? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Didn't the Bible say Jesus could work no miracles there? 
Hmm. Yeah, because of their unbelief. Everywhere else that Jesus went, the multitudes, how many are multitudes? That's just thousands of people at least, right? The multitudes were showing up with their faith. They showed up with faith. And guess what happened when they did that? Everyone got healed. Everyone got healed. Jesus wanted to take this same thing to his own hometown, but here's what they said. Oh, aren't you just that silly boy that we knew growing up? Come on. And even so, in the midst of this extreme unbelief, Jesus was still able to accomplish something. Did you know that? He still was able to accomplish something. Take a look at this. Mark chapter 6, verse 5. And because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. You mean he could still heal people? <laughs> that was the one thing that he could still do. Amazing. So in all those other places in the Bible, Jesus didn't have to lay his hands on the sick for them to be healed. He simply taught them the word of God and then they received healing through their faith. The multitudes just received healing where they were. But even when there was unbelief present, he could go lay his hands on the sick and they would recover because he was operating in faith. Isn't that amazing? It's like God wants us to be healed. It's like he wants us to be healed. Every time the sick came to Jesus, he healed them. It's always God's will to heal. Always. You know, the Chosen TV series is mostly a good thing to watch. Mostly. But they have this thing wrong, this one thing. In more than, in more than one case throughout those episodes, they've painted this picture that there were times that Jesus chose not to heal. And that chaps my hide. I'm up here working hard to deposit faith on the inside of you. And then that chosen comes and it just tries to snatch it right away. Ugh. I ain't having it. You got to know this is an antichrist doctrine and I rebuke it. Anytime somebody paints this picture of Jesus that he didn't want to heal every time, antichrist, because it's not him. That is not Jesus. And we all know somebody who wanted to be healed but died instead. Most of us even have firsthand experience of wanting to be healed and not receiving it for whatever reason. And then we try to fit God into our experiences. We're testing the word of God with our experiences. If I see it, then I'll believe it. Doesn't this very thing reveal the reason that we're not receiving healing? It shouldn't like... Like an alarm's going off, right? <laughs> We're clearly not in faith when we have to see it to believe it. We're clearly not in faith when, when we hold God accountable to what somebody else said. When we hold God accountable to what somebody else experienced. Well, they said they were believing, but then they died. Yeah. So are you going to hold God accountable to what they said? Or are you going to hold God accountable to what he said in his word? Let God be true. And every man, a liar. People lie. Did you know that? You ever known somebody to lie? Sometimes intentionally, sometimes not. I mean, have you ever convinced yourself that you were in faith just to find out later that you weren't? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, my belief about healing is only going to come from the word of God. You need to make this resolve in your heart. My belief about healing will only come from the word of God, not, not based on what the chosen told me but by the word of God. I will not base my belief on what I see with my own eyes. I'm not going to do it. What I see could be the result of a lie because people lie. But God's word is always true. Friday morning, I was lying in bed thinking about the word and talking to him, to the Lord about it. It was kind of, it was a very peaceful quiet time, so to speak. And I was dozing off and on, falling asleep and waking up, falling asleep and waking up, which by the way, just allow that to set you free right now because the enemy likes to tell you when you fall asleep during your quiet time, Autumn, if you fall asleep during your quiet time, God doesn't get upset. He just sits there and he waits. And then you wake up and he says, oh, hey, so what we were talking about was, I'm serious. This is how God works. He is a loving father. He's not a critical father. He is not mad at you for falling asleep. He's probably like, oh, look, they're so cute. And then you wake up and he's like, so, yeah, we were talking about this. So I was having one of those moments and, and then I slipped into a vision or a dream. I'm not sure if I was awake or asleep, so I don't know which one it was, but I was hovering with Jesus over in the corner of a chapel of a funeral home and it was full of people. And then I looked in the casket, it was my body. I was like, hey, what am I doing down there? And very quickly, the whole process unfolded to where 
my body was being placed into the ground and then it was being covered with dirt. And at this point, I looked over at Jesus with a concerned look on my face, like, what are you trying to show me? And then Jesus asked me a question, which is usually how he teaches me. Anybody else? He asks you a question to teach you. He said, what happens to sickness that you take to the grave? And I answered, it all dies. It withers away because it can't survive without a life source. And when I woke up, the scripture rose up out of my spirit. You are dead to sin and alive to God. And then I heard the Holy Spirit say this, that means you are also dead to sickness. In Christ, you are dead to sickness. Sickness has no chance in your body. You put Jesus in, in charge by releasing your faith and he drives out every bit of sickness, just drives it on out of there. Mm. That's good, huh? Let it settle in. About a year ago, I preached my first ever sermon on casting out demons. <laughs> I remember it like it was yesterday. <laughs> I managed to avoid the subject up to that point. But when the Holy Spirit said I had to teach it, I don't tell him no. I do what he says. It's better that way. Most everything that I believed about casting out demons up to that point was all destroyed in one sermon. My own sermon was destroying my own beliefs. I know you all may look at me like I got it all figured out up here, but a lot of times I'm getting taught just as you're getting taught. And I got the benefit of hearing my own voice say it like several different times. It's wonderful. So the Holy Spirit took me to the Word of God. He all cleared this, he cleared this up really quickly because we like to make this casting out demons thing a really complicated thing, and it's not complicated. It's actually really simple. Growing up in the church, I was taught that Christians can't have demons, and you know that sounded right, and I didn't want to have a demon, so I was just like, okay, sounds great. And then I preached that sermon about the simplicity of casting out demons, and I had no idea of what was going to happen next. The Holy Spirit didn't fill me in on that one. He just had me teach about casting out demons. And at the end of the service, I was releasing a tongue and interpretation, and it was then interrupted by this annoying chatter coming out of my mouth, and the whole room went silent. And I dropped to my knees, and I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, what was that? And his answer was, you know what that was. That was a manifestation of an unclean spirit. Deal with it, just like I told you to in that sermon that you just preached. So I sat there and I wrestled with it. Well, what are people going to think? What happens to the church if their pastor gets delivered from a demon? Maybe I should just go on like nothing happened. And the whole time, the Holy Spirit kept nudging me, deal with it, deal with it, deal with it, deal with it. So I mustered up the courage and I stood up and I said, that was a manifestation. And one of you were led to come up and deal with it, but you didn't come up and deal with it because I'm your pastor. Who was it? Immediately, somebody came up like that, weeping. And I surrendered to the work of the Holy Spirit and that demon came out. And once it was out, I knew what it was, a spirit of infirmity. And interestingly, I'd gotten used to the sickness. I'd gotten so used to the sickness that I had that it took me a few months to figure out what actually happened there. What was I delivered from? What healing took place that day? For one, I used to wake up in the middle of the night every couple of months. It was kind of like it was on a schedule with a terrible stomach ache. And I'd go to the bathroom and I would puke. And it was always a violent puking experience. It was awful. Interestingly, it was always on a Saturday night. Every time, it was on a Saturday night. And clearly, the enemy was trying to prevent me from coming here to give you the Word of God, although it never worked. I'm kind of hard-headed. Actually, I'm really hard-headed. So I'm like, nah, not, you're not stopping me. I'm getting up, and I'm going to church, and I'm delivering the Word of God. But guess what? I haven't puked once since the spirit of infirmity was cast out. Not once. That's never happened again. And the other healing that came was more of a personal matter. I'll just put it to you this way. Intimacy with my wife was an experience that ended in subtle pain. And this had been going on for so long, I just thought it was normal. So I learned how to live with it. Beth and I had a little getaway a few months after my deliverance. And after a few nights of romance, it hit me. There's no pain. <laughs> it was amazing. And the third way my healing is manifested is the repair of my jawbone. Due to a root canal that went wrong, there had been an ongoing subtle infection in my jaw, and it was just eating away at my jaw. 
So x-rays revealed that there's just a hole in my jaw from this taking place. And that area was always tender to the touch for years. For years it had been that way. And a few months ago, I was sitting outside talking to the Lord, and I heard the Holy Spirit say, did you notice your jaw? And I said, huh? And I, I started feeling, I was like, it's, it's not there anymore. The tenderness is not there. So I'm on this journey of discovering all kinds of healing taking place in my body. I mean, these are miracles. This like your jaw being repaired, that's not something that just happens. That's amazing. The Lord is good. So can a Christian have a demon? This sparks some wild debates online. Have you ever typed that into YouTube? Can a Christian have a demon? Wild debates. So let me give you the answer as the Holy Spirit taught it to me through the Word of God. You're asking the wrong question. Because no matter how you answer this question, it puts people in bondage. If we say, yes, Christians can have demons, all the Christians get fearful and then start worrying that they have a demon. If you say, no, they can't, then one of two things happens. Christians are left with sickness that they can't get rid of, or Christians get delivered and then they doubt their salvation. If this was a question we were supposed to be asking, Jesus would have given us an instruction like, all right, make sure that they're not saved first and then cast out the demon. This question is unnecessary. Jesus told us what to do with demons. Cast them out. <laughs> so when someone asks you if a Christian can have a demon, say this. You're asking the wrong question. Let me ask you a question. What did Jesus say to do with demons? Cast them out. And then let's leave it at that. Amen. Simple as that. So I want you to remember this today. In Christ, you are dead to sickness. That is the gospel truth. Sickness has no chance in your body. Put Jesus Christ in charge by releasing your faith, and he will drive out every sickness, whether it's caused by a spirit of infirmity or something else. It's time to let Christ drive out every bit of sickness out of your body. Who cares what the cause is? Just get healing. Find healing. Live in healing because it belongs to you. It's the promise of God, and all of his promises are yes, and amen. So be it. Amen.